Hi hey guys, uh, Patrick here. Uh, today's video will be an interview with authors. I'll keep this one brief. Uh, basically, uh, there's a few things you should know first. This is the first time I, uh, I do a video interview with authors. The second one being that this interview is pre-recorded. That means I don't have the new mic equipment yet. So please understand if the audio quality is not as good as my previous video. And the third and final thing that you should know about this interview is that uh, during the video, in the second half of the interview, we had to cut off the videos uh, because the internet connection was really bad. The audio stays though, but there's probably some delay here and there. I hope uh, you guys will still enjoy the video. Well, that's it. Uh, enjoy the interview. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to my first video chat with an author. And today we have uh, Rebecca Kwong, the author behind the Poppy War Trilogy. Uh, hi, Rebecca. Uh, thank you so much hi, for Patrick. making this. <laughs> thank you uh, for having me. I'm so honored to be your first author interview. <laughs> uh, so uh, maybe introduce yourself first uh, to the audience. Sure. So I'm Rebecca Kwong. Um, I wrote the Poppy War Trilogy. That's the Poppy War, the Dragon Republic, and the Burning God, which is coming out on November 17th. And um, so I am a student. I study Chinese history and literature, and I'll be starting my PhD um, in East Asian languages and literatures at Yale next fall. Uh, you have become an author for uh, more than two years right now. Yeah. Uh... So I've heard from several authors that ever since they become an author, they cannot uh, read fantasy books for fun anymore. Do you ever feel the same way? Yeah, I, that's a really good question. And um, I know a lot of authors who also have a similar problem. And there are a couple of reasons behind this. The first is that I think when you're working on a novel about like a specific, you know, in a specific genre or about a specific set of tropes, or inspired by like a specific mythology, it can be like really nerve wracking. And um, like it just interferes with your process to read books that are like too similar to what you're writing. Because like writers, I think are like pretty like insecure, anxious people. And we get really scared if like, it seems like somebody else has like already written the story idea that we want to write. Or like, so for me, for example, um, when I was drafting The Poppy War, I think Ken Liu's The Grace of Kings had just come out like two years ago and it was the first time I'd heard of it. And it was also like the first big like major Asian fantasy novel by like an Asian writer that was published by like a main, uh, like a big five publishing house in the US. Um, so like, obviously I wanted to read it because I was super excited about having a book that like kind of set the standard or the, the model for what I was trying to do. But then I got about like a couple hundred pages in and then I was like really nervous because he draws on a lot of the same mythology and the same historical characters as I do. And I was scared that if I kept reading The Grace of Kings, then the poppy war was just going to seem like a bad imitation of what he'd already done. So I had to put that aside for a while until I finished the poppy war and then I could go back and read it. Um, so that's the first thing and like I, I still have this problem like whenever I'm working on a certain project I can't read too much like within like you know in relation to that project otherwise I'll just like start unconsciously like borrowing other people's story ideas or using tropes that they did and you know like being accused of like unoriginality is a really scary thing as a writer um but then the other issue is when you start getting good at writing and you develop like your inner editor and your inner critic, um, that like kind of raises your standard for other books that you read. So like books I used to just enjoy and like have no issue with, like now when I read them, I'm like, oh, like it does this thing wrong or, you know, it's an, a, employing like this tired trope or like I don't specifically like the way that voice or like tense are being used here. Um, so I think like for me, at least it's like, raise the bar for what is good literature. Um, but in another sense, it's also made me a kinder reader because I used to be the sort of reviewer who was like, this book is like objectively good or this book is objectively awful and nobody should read it. But now as an author, I understand that, like, so like I've received reviews that are like, oh, the poppy war is bad at doing like X, Y, Z thing. And on my end, it's like, 
but I was intentionally not doing those things or like I made those pacing decisions like for a deliberate reason so now when I read like other authors work and I'm like wow the pacing is really slow like it feels like the characters are just meandering and like you know exploring the world instead of like seeing that as criticism I realized that's an intentional decision on the author's part and they want to slow down the pacing because they like to explore the world so even if it's not like an artistic decision that I personally as a reader enjoy uh, that doesn't mean that the author failed at what they were trying to do it just means that the author uh, was trying to do something that doesn't appeal to me personally as a reader um so it's like made me both like a harsher and kinder reader I think um but I want to flip the same question back at you uh, because you review and <laughs> you write very long reviews of an astonishing number of books. Like I skimmed through some of your Goodreads reviews and it just like seems like you're reading constantly. And um, some of your reviews are quite critical and some are like, you know, very kind. So I wonder like, um, as somebody who's been in the reviewing community for so long and has like, you know, picked apart so many books, does that also affect your ability to just like enjoy a book? Or are you always like reading with an eye for, how you're going to critique it afterwards. Uh, technically, I'm still considered uh, quite a new reader because uh, I've been reading for uh, adult fantasy novels for four years now. And, and some people assume that I've been reading uh, novels for much longer. Uh, that's not true. And yeah, uh, ever since I became a reviewer, uh, I wouldn't say critical, but uh, I'm, I'm definitely a more emotional uh, reader. And sometimes I do no, notice things uh, unconsciously. For example, uh, I see that uh, the great, uh, maybe the best example of this one is, uh, you know, the common phrase, uh, I let out a breath I didn't realize I was holding. You, yeah, you, you, <laughs> you, you, you know that, that one, uh, a lot of authors use that one uh, because it's used so often that, uh, it can be distracting that one, but and but I didn't purposely look for that. I didn't purposely look for that sentence. It just oh, uh, the author used this sentence. That's it. And for books, uh, for a lot of books, I just let what I read. Uh, um, I just let my emotions. I just let my emotion uh, judge what I read. Do I find it boring? Uh, why is it boring? Uh, do, do I find it uh, really compelling? Uh, why why is that then that's how i operate with my reviews yeah uh yeah that's so funny <laughs> like like the line <laughs> i let out a breath i didn't know i was holding because like i think that especially for debut authors like sometimes like so we definitely don't realize that these lines are like cliches and i think they just like stick in our heads because we read them pretty often and we're like oh like that's a good sentence i like how it sounds so like when i wrote like 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 she let her breath she had no she was like I had no idea that it was such a criticized line I um, mean it wasn't until like that like I started like you know reading books more critically and like being plugged into like book twitter that I realized um it is such a trope um another trope that I used without realizing it was a trope was um describing Naja in the first book uh, as having sorry. almond shape shaped eyes like an annoying like trope especially in western literature to describe asian characters um so i i still don't think there's anything wrong inherently with saying an asian character has almond shaped eyes uh because like that is in fact a valid descriptor like that's a shape that eyes can have <laughs> i think what's wrong is when like white authors use it exclusively to de describe asian characters as like their only relevant facial trait um but uh, yeah like See what <laughs> it can be hard to debut before you know like all the things that are wrong that um, you could be doing yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh speaking uh of your books uh the burning god is coming out soon and early reviews have all been very positive though you probably make a lot of readers cry uh how do you feel about all this <laughs> yeah so i I've like spent a lot of time wondering like why it feels so like gleefully good when people have like such like adverse emotional reactions um, to your books as an author. And I think it's, well, cause I think it means that like the author has succeeded in creating characters that are so lovable 
that people get so attached to that they like really feel something when something bad happens to those characters like that's a great artistic compliment that like I crafted somebody like so three-dimensional um with like goals and motivations and, and personality traits that resonated with people so much that they were sad to see them go um but yeah I it makes me feel really good <laughs> that people are really shook and upset about the burning god um because that's what I was going for because I think like any ending especially that uh would have you know left people feeling happy or relieved would not have been the right ending for this trilogy yeah like, that's true. I think would have been you know, I'm sad, like, and like, I, so I want to talk with you about manga, and it's like, I feel sometimes about like the endings of mangas, where like, everybody's alive, and everyone's happy, oh. and like, all the main characters are married to each other, like the ending of Bleach, uh, that's just so disappointing, that's not right, not, you don't have to have a happy ever after, like, not everybody makes it to the end, and that's fine. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get what you mean. I, I totally get what you mean. Uh, oh, okay. So, well, so now that we're on the topic of <laughs> manga, talk about some of your favorites. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, do you do you read a lot of manga, actually? So, I read a lot of manga when I was in elementary, middle, and high school. And so I basically stopped reading manga when my favorite mangas that I'd been following for like years and years ended. So like once like Naruto and Bleach ended, I felt yeah. like, you know, I didn't really have a reason to keep going. Um, time it was hard for me to get really sucked into a new manga. So I'm not like up to date with the world of shonen manga now, but I used to be. Um, so what are some of your favorite manga series and why? Ah, uh, right now it would probably be uh, My Hero Academia, and then uh, there's also Full Metal Alchemist, uh, Death Note, uh, and then uh, Demon Slayer. I actually have so many manga that I love right now, and uh, not not too many of them uh, that I love actually did something new with the uh, media, but I just... Uh, love the artwork and uh, the familiar feeling that I got. Like, I know uh, that, oh, this is uh, probably going to happen, but they managed to do it so effectively. Uh, yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah, for me, I think loving manga is a lot about the aesthetic and just, like, the way that characters are stylized. And I think I, like, learned a lot about how to do character work and character descriptions by being super into manga because I mean I employ a lot of like you know the anime tropes of like the dark brooding <laughs> like senpai <laughs> and like you know the school rival um and yeah like there are just like so many um manga tropes and like storytelling traditions that are like engraved in my bones and that I really <laughs> can't get rid of um, but like the, but I think it was always about the art style for me. Like the reason why I love Bleach so much, even though the storyline got kind of silly near the end, is because yeah. like I think T.D. Kubo's art, especially like early on, his art style was so edgy and like cool. Oh. Like he was he was very like rock star, you know. Because um, I also <laughs> enjoyed the earlier series he did that got canceled before he did Bleach called like zombie powder or something and that was like in the wild west and everybody was in like ridiculous outfits and like the main character had this massive sword and it was like it was so <laughs> dumb but i loved it so much because everyone was so fucking cool <laughs> i i didn't actually read that one i think i have to give it a try now <laughs> it's pretty fun mm, um, yeah. but also like a lot of the mangas or manhwas really that, that influenced the poppy war were Korean martial arts um, manhwa. Oh, yeah. So I read Veritas and The Breaker uh, oh, like shortly so before I started writing The Poppy War. And man, I, I really, really love Veritas, but it seems like we're just never going to get a second part, which makes me sad because I want to see how it ends. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't know that you uh, read The Breaker. I think you're the first one that I've heard of. <laughs> 
that, that actually read The Breaker. I love that book. The Breaker is so fun. Yeah, The Breaker and the second season, The Breaker New Ways. I haven't read that. Um, I heard mm. it wasn't quite as good. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not as good as the first one, but I think it's still pretty good. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, your, next, your next book after The Burning God is a very different book from the Poppy War trilogy, right? Yeah. Is your new book uh, more difficult or is it easier to write at the moment? So it, I intentionally wanted to level up and do something that was really going to challenge me and force me to write in a different way than I had been with the Poppy Word trilogy. Um, and I had a conversation about this with um, V. E. Schwab, where I asked her, like, how, how do you make sure that your like, new project doesn't end up sounding just like a pale imitation of the original project? Because when I started drafting the new book, I, I really struggled with, like, the characters kept sounding like echoes of Rin, Kataya, Nadja, and, and I needed to move away from them. And she said that you should try to change something structurally about the way that you're telling the story um, to, like, really, you know, get a start over, have a fresh palette, etc. cetera. Um, so the Oxford book is really different in that it's not... So the whole Poppy War trilogy is obviously it's a trilogy, so it's told over three acts, and each book adheres very closely to a three-act structure. Like, they're even divided into parts that, that adhere to the three acts, but the Oxford book is a standalone. It's not a trilogy. It's, it's a five-act book, so a lot oh. more happens in a single book, um, which has also been, like, more complicated to grapple with plot-wise. Um, there are oh. more main characters, like... So I had been using Rin as the POV character for the entirety of the Pop War trilogy, except for, you know, like some scenes as an exception. And, and this yeah. time I'm working with four central characters and, and focusing on the relationships between them. So that's been difficult as well. Um, I also try to challenge myself with the voice. So it's set in 1830s um, Oxford. Uh, so I read a lot of Victorian literature and I tried to imitate the cadence of their dialogue and especially and so I'm interested in like the Victorian buildings Roman the the coming of age story because I want to do an inversion of that um but uh. so I read you know a lot of Dickens and so like David Copperfield etc I I'm, I'm trying to study like how how he traces a character as they grow up and then you know do do various important things um so yeah it's it just pays homage to an entirely different literary tradition, which has been a really good challenge for me and has helped me move as far away from the popular trilogy as I can. Ah, uh, wow. It, it sounds awesome. <laughs> and that's a lot of research you've done for this book. I'm, I'm definitely looking forward yeah, to it. I, I was actually a little uh, intimidated at the beginning because, so like, I'm not even that big of a fan of most Victorian literature. Like, <laughs> you know, I used to think like Austin, like, or Austin's not Victorian, but but she's writing within the era that would be relevant to the characters. But like Dickens, et cetera, like they just like never really interested me before. Um, but I felt like in order to be able to like write authentically or, you know, write convincingly from that period, I had to study the voice of it. Um, and the only way to do that was just to like immerse myself in the literature. Um, but, you know, a couple weeks of force feeding <laughs> myself, like Dickens and Thackeray, um, I, I think I've got a, a handle on, like, the dialogue and, you know, like, what kind of cabs were they writing? What did the streets of London look like? Um, what kind of vocabulary did they use, et cetera? Um, but on the topic of moving on from a new series, I wanted to ask you, do you ever feel, like, a sense of disappointment or disorientation when when an author that you really enjoy moves on to writing something new? Oh, this is a difficult one. Uh, I think it kind of depends on how this series ended first. I, I definitely don't like when, uh, when an author forcefully, I mean, let's say the trilogy has ended, but they, they know that if they write a new book in the series, it will sell, but the story has finished. Like, uh, I don't like it when they have to uh, force a new installment in that uh, in in a series that or that's already finished. I don't like that. But 
Uh, I like it. Uh, I kind of like it when uh, an author uh, started to write something that's totally different. I think it's, uh, it's always an interesting take. Uh, and I, uh, I definitely will be curious to find out uh, uh, what kind of stories they will tell next, like what you're doing right now. That's actually uh, very exciting because I want to know what... Uh, uh, so Rebecca is now moving, moving away from the poppy war. So I want to know what, what kind of stories she can do next. Not, not too confusing in my opinion. I actually like it. As long as the story has been finished that and completed, yeah, I'm I'm all for new something new. I think the only time when I feel like a strong sense of disappointment is when the author like returns to that world but That's writes a right. book with the same characters, like the characters that we've come to love and grow really attached to, but like, you know, like the stakes aren't really there and there's just all kind of like muddling around and it it feels very disappointing. And I think the reason yeah. why I really don't like these kinds of books, like, so I'm thinking about like, like um, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, which like, you know, <laughs> obviously I was really, really into Harry Potter as a child as many of us were. And now it's, it's a lot more difficult to support. Um, yeah. <laughs> but at least when the Cursed Child came out, I was just so excited because I missed, you know, Draco and Harry and Hermione so much, but it was yeah. just like, it was weird to me because like, I think the reason why we grow so attached to the central characters of like big fantasy series is because we get to know them in the context of the storyline that we're invested in. So like the big arcing, like the big sweeping arc of the trilogy. And then once you take the characters outside of that story, like for example, like if, if you wrote a book about Rin, Katai, and Nudge, et cetera, like after yeah. the end of The Burning God, well, I don't know if you could do that. But, like, without those stakes, without, you know, the plot line, without the war going on, like, what is there for them to do, right? Ah, uh, yeah, like, yeah. you know, yeah. the stakes aren't there anymore. They're not interested characters anymore. They're just living their lives. So you either have to invent, like, a whole new storyline, or I think it's best to just leave and move on to something new. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, so, uh, that's it for today's uh, video chat with Rebecca Kwang. So, Rebecca, do you have a last message for your future readers? Well, first, thanks for sticking with us through the tech issues, and I hope this is fun regardless. And um, I really hope y'all enjoy The Burning God when it comes out on November 17th, and make sure to have a box of tissues ready. She's right, you know. <laughs> well. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for uh, making the time to do this. And again, I'm sorry for all the technical issues. No worries. Thanks so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye.